Okay, excellent. So I'm here today. My name is Nick and I've got the pleasure of being here with Leonie Garland. And today we only have a certain amount of time, but I'm going to start to unpack some of Leonie's story. Um, Leonie, hello. Hello, Nick. Thank you. Thank you for having me in your home. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm really, really excited. So the first kind of question, nice, nice little question I got for you is... How did God, or when did God first become real to you? Well, that's a little bit complicated because if you want to know when I became a Christian, that's a bit later. Okay. But the first time that he really became real to me, I was four years old. Wow. And my cat had cat flu, wasn't expected in those days to recover from it. She was a very tiny cat hmm. and quite weak and at four years old nobody told me about laying hands on anybody but I remember putting my hand on my cat and calling out to God praying and asking God to heal my cat which he did completely wow so were you that part of a Christian family well my family again was not quite the normal family because my dad was German Jewish my mum was originally Welsh Baptist, but never got baptised because she was frightened of water. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so it was a bit of an interesting family. There was no Jewish synagogue in the area, so they did send me to Sunday school because they wanted me to have a moral upbringing. Okay, and it's sort of, there were churches available. There were churches available. Mm. But, um, so I went for a little while to Sunday school, and then I didn't. And then in my teens, I had the chance to go with a friend to confirmation classes. But I had been um, baptised as a baby, sort of, when I was a four-year-old, actually. So you were christened? I was christened as a four-year-old, yeah. I was christened as a four-year-old and then started going to Sunday school. As a 13-year-old, I think I was, I went with my friend Helen, who I think was a Christian by then, to confirmation classes. And just for clarity, confirmation classes are essentially a Church of England. They're a Church of England. It's, if you like, it's when you get to adult age and you make the decision for yourself to be, to be a Christian. Okay. And the, the bishop comes and everything. Hmm. Um, I didn't become a Christian properly through confirmation classes, but the very wise vicar said to us all, it would be a good idea if you started reading the Bible because that's the way you'll get to know Jesus properly and what he's all about. And so I started reading the Bible and underlining lots of things that at the time seemed relevant to me. Mm. So my Bible had lots of underlining in it. Right. But I still didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And I mean, obviously, this is quite a specific question, so don't worry if you can't remember. But what kind of things were you underlining? Was it just the the things that Jesus was saying, or what? He, what was sticking out to you, as it were? Well, lots of lots of different things mm. were were sort of sticking out to me. Yes, uh, things to do with lifestyle. Mm. Yes, um, things that Jesus said. I'm sure, because all the way through that. I was going back to my mum and dad, and my dad in particular, I would begin to have the sort of first stirrings of faith, and my dad was very good at arguing me out of everything that I started to believe. So your dad was a practising Jew? No. Okay. He, he right, it, again, complicated. He had been a practising Jew. He was German Jewish. He'd been to concentration camp. Oh, my goodness. Concentration camp, uh, they gave them dispensation to eat whatever, including pork, and they never rescinded the the, the, uh, the special dispensation, according to him. Wow. So he continued life eating whatever. Right. And because he lived in Weymouth, there wasn't a synagogue in Weymouth. So he was not practising as such, but okay. he still had very basic Jewish beliefs. So, but obviously your dad, particularly you're coming speaking about Christianity, Jesus, yeah. 
everything in him would be to disprove. Absolutely. Okay. And he was very good at disproving anything you would have liked to have mentioned. OK. My family were very good at arguing. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I had that going on all the time. Yeah. And then I went to college to become a teacher, College of Education. Mm. Unbeknown to me, throughout my first year, I was going to a Christian union, but was a bit iffy. Sometimes I went, sometimes I didn't. Mm. The head of the Christian union fasted and prayed for me every week for that first year, and I knew nothing about it. Wow. He was in his third year and he left. Okay. The year after he fasted and prayed for me, um, partway through the first term, I became seriously ill and nothing the doctors were giving me was touching it. And they actually sent me home, not to die, but I was very seriously ill. Mm. And I couldn't go without coughing to college, partly because everybody smoked. But mm. I just, I kept coughing and coughing. And I suddenly was facing questions of life and death, yeah. like I'd never done before. I was scared. Mm. And a friend of mine gave me the book Prison to Praise, which I started reading, which was interesting reading and that sort of provoked a lot of things and then I went for a weekend away with my youth group from church so just to, just to be clear so you'd, you'd gone to Sunday school you'd gone to these confirmation classes you were very much interested and signed up to the sort of for want of a better way of saying moral lifestyle yes. that Christianity brought you're going to this CU at university you're part of a youth group so you're not against Christianity in any way, but at this point you'd still say you haven't yet made that decision. I hadn't made the decision properly right. at that point. And part of it was both my mum and my dad uh, would question things. My mum's big thing was, well, Jesus never said he was the Messiah. Jesus never said this. She, he never said that. Okay. And I didn't know my Bible. That's one of the reasons I was underlining lots of things in the Bible, because I was trying to prove her wrong. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, but at that weekend away, I suddenly realised that some of my friends obviously knew Jesus in a way that I didn't. Mm. They weren't just praying prayers to a vague being out there. They seemed to have a relationship with Jesus mm. and there seemed to be a power in their prayers which I didn't always know in mine and I wanted to know more and I remember that one of the speakers at the weekend recommended a book called Basic Christianity but I started reading it desperate to really find Jesus and the night before I went back to college I was reading it and I got to the bit where it said, God, if you're real, make yourself real to me. And at that point, I prayed that prayer, and a voice in my head said, look at John 4, which is the story of the woman at the well. And I read John 4. There wasn't one underlining in any of it. So I'd obviously not read it before. Right. So it was a new story it to was, you at this it point. Was, I knew the story, okay. but I'd never read it and underlined it, so I'd obviously not really paid attention to okay. it. And it completely disproved what my mum had said, because Jesus says very clearly in it, I am the Messiah, mm -hmm. which, having a Jewish father as well, I understood. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I realised that God was real, and... I chose to follow him. And the next day I went back to college. So my father had no chance to argue me out of anything. Wow. Um, and by the time I saw him again at Easter time, I'd had a, I'd been through a teaching practice where I'd seen God turn up and do all sorts of amazing things in a very difficult school where the first thing I was presented with, as I walked in with the head teacher, the teacher um, held up the foot of a little boy in the class to show the head teacher that his father had ripped the nail off his toe. 
So you're, this is your kind of placement as a this student teacher? This was my teacher. placement you're... as a student teacher. Wow. Um, long story short, this little boy was one of a group of boys that his father had fathered from different ladies. And this little boy, his, uh, his stepbrothers had st uh, stole my, my bag one day hmm. and God gave me the wisdom to say to this little boy who was at the time helping me clear up, oh, I seem to have misplaced my bag, Christopher. Do you think you could help me find it? And he went straight to where it had been hidden and he got my bag back for me. At this at this point, so you're, I'm assuming you're around somewhere at the age of between 19 to 20. I was 20. Okay. I was 20. Cool. So you're 20 years old. So you've read one chapter of a book. Don't worry. This this is not a book <laughs> review. So uh, yeah. But so, but something in that spoke to you, and you Jesus has revealed that He is the Messiah. And then almost what's then rolled on is this: you've gone into a teaching placement. You've started started to see God move. And in really and I've had Christian friends who've prayed with me as I've as mm. I've met various challenges. It, as I said, it was quite a challenging school, but my Christian friends prayed with me as I met the different challenges. And we saw behaviour turn around. We saw um, this little boy who was very damaged. Mm. Uh, just suddenly he, he felt cared. He, God allowed me to care for this little boy. But we'd had some missionaries come to talk at Christian Union and we were supposed to be feeding them, giving them a meal. And there were only supposed to be two, but four turned up. And my friend and my friend said, well, there's a feeding of the 5,000. We're going to pray over this food and it'll go far enough. And sure enough, it did. Amazing. <laughs> and nobody went hungry. Yeah. So we saw little minor miracles in amongst everything just at just in that term yeah. before I even got back to my dad. So when my dad said, yes, but I said, well, you can't. I said, I can't deny what I've actually seen with my own eyes, dad. Mm. And there was nothing he could say that could dissuade me now. So at this point, did your parents just agree to disagree kind of thing? Or was it always an issue of contention? Um, I think I was probably a little bit harsh as a young Christian and I was definitely sort of a Bible bashing type person. Okay. And there was a point where my father forbade me to talk about Jesus at home. Wow, okay. So you had that so at that zealous point, kind of Yes, I was rather zealous. So at that point I didn't know what to do and I remember talking to a friend and when they said send him a letter telling him about Jesus and agreeing that you will never talk again about Jesus until he brings it up, brings it up. Okay. So I did just that and then I prayed hard for somebody else apart from me to come alongside him who could share Jesus with him. Yeah. God provides interesting people. So I had a good friend who was a Christian dentist and he was a chess player and my dad was a chess player. So this guy used to meet with my dad weekly to play chess, but he shared his he was sharing his Christian faith at the same time with my dad. Mm. And when my dad eventually died, um, he was about to go back to Jewish shul to, to re become a Jew. And I thought, oh, you know, he'd not ever come to know Jesus. But when I got down there to see my mum. On his desk, there was a New Testament opened. Uh, and he had never, ever read the New Testament of the Bible before. Wow. And I really feel that God took him before he could change his mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to come back to other ways in which you've seen God move in your life. But I'd love to know, because I've known you my whole life. You know, you have a daughter who is a couple of weeks younger than me. So, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time in this house um, as, a, as a child and as a teenager. And so I'd love to know how just, you know, just hearing a little bit of your story so far, how you've got from Weymouth to um, College of Teaching. Sorry, I might have described it wrong. How did you end up 
in Good Mays as um, part of this church community for, I'm going to be 35 in a, in a couple of months. So I'm assuming at least 30, 35 years and yeah. And more. <laughs> <laughs> complicated story as as always I'm afraid um yeah I was I was at College of Education in Exeter Exeter okay so we've gone from Weymouth to Exeter, to Exeter. I'd have liked a job in Exeter God chose otherwise um Exeter was a very beautiful place to live in okay yeah I really didn't want to be in London but the year that I qualified there were too many teachers for the jobs that were going and my, my sister at the time was living up in London and she said, well, there'll be jobs up in London because nobody wants to work in London. Wow. And you taught languages? I taught languages. I taught French, just French. In secondary, so secondary school age, French? Well, no. Oh. I actually taught, I was trained primary and secondary. Okay. And I had only ever done teaching practices in primary schools. Okay. So at the at that point, they were teaching French in the primary school. But the year I qualified, they stopped teaching French in the primary school. Uh. So I came up to London and I managed to get some temporary work in a school near to my sister. And one of the jobs I'd applied for was at Seven Kings School. They weren't interested in me. OK. But they passed on my... Um, my CV to Hainalt High and Hainalt contacted me at my sister's and um, I went for interview and got the job so that's how I landed up up here so at it, that point you kind of reloc I relocated high barn, it was a bit too far and the job was not just French I had lots of things you don't know about me Nick <laughs> I had done a one term drama uh, oh, qualification. You've kept that on the down low. Yeah, uh, at uh, college. And so I was landing up teaching. And also I was primary trained as well. So I was trained to teach anything. Yeah. So I landed up teaching French, drama and RE. It was, I mean, Hainault was a very difficult school in those days. And the children were certainly very challenging. And I was not used to children were quite so challenging as that mm. um, my advisor managed to get me a job in Chadwell Heath and there again there was another little minor miracle because mm. after teaching there for a term I had to apply for the job I'd been doing and I'm not good at interviews usually or I wasn't in those days I was incredibly shy in those days Okay, and the day of the interview, every other candidate phoned up with an excuse as to why they couldn't be there. And I was the only candidate left. And so I got the job. Yeah. God knew what I, would, I needed. Yeah. So he just got rid of the opposition. And I stayed at um, Chadwell Heath for eight and a half years until I got married. I was living over in Wanstead, which, and it was quite difficult to get to church. It was quite difficult to get to school at Chadwell Heath. Mm. And there were people in the church who had a house group in that was sort of more in Redbridge rather than right over there. It was sort of based more nearer to Ilford, which okay. was obviously a lot easier to get to Chadwell Heath from. Mm. And one of the ladies, she worked in a school and they got things about accommodation that school teachers were wanting to share mm -hmm. and Angela had put an advert for somebody to share a flat mm. and so I, I started sharing the flat with Angela due to that advert yeah whilst I was living with Angela in Ilford we got to know somebody up the road um, who was a business lady who was very important in the next story because my parents decided I was now old and I wasn't obviously going to get married. What that age are you, sorry, at this I point? I was probably in, in my mid to late 20s. OK, all right. But decided for it. my father, he decided I was never going to get married. OK, OK. So he gave me my dowry to go to Israel. So I had several hundred pounds so that I could go to Israel. 
Right. Booked quite late in the day uh, to go to Israel. Got to the plane. And that year, Ramadan, Pesach and Easter coincided. And they had triple booked the plane. So the last people to book didn't get on the plane and I was one of the last to book. Oh my goodness. There were quite a few of us that didn't get on the plane yeah. because they'd literally triple booked it. And I was sent home and told to come back the next day. And the next day I came back with this lady up the road okay, who knew all the right buttons to press to get things happening right she had that savvy she had the savvy of the right words to use to threaten if you had to which you know god just provided her to get me on this plane so i get on the plane the next day and i'm told to get from tel aviv to get a jewish taxi all the way to it was just outside jerusalem yeah we were staying in an arab township outside jerusalem okay now this is a jewish taxi going to an arab township A month before the war in Lebanon broke out. Tensions at this point are incredibly high. So he dropped me about 11 o'clock at night outside my hotel and went. He wasn't going to hang about. Mm. At that point, I discovered that there was a lock on the gate leading to the hotel that I couldn't get into. And I started praying in tongues because I really couldn't think straight in English. Wow. About five or ten minutes later, an Arab taxi driver came out of the darkness. He basically said, look the other way. And he picked the lock and got me into the hotel. And he spoke fluent English and fluent Arabic. So he said to me, you're very lucky. The only people on site that are... um, staff are Arabic speaking and so he explained to them what had happened because I'd explained the whole saga to him and it was a cu- the cook came there and she let me in and I was able to get into the hotel so again I'd seen God turn up with just the right sort of person to get me into the hotel yeah. he needed very special um <laughs> skill set skill set yeah <laughs> very special skill set um so sorry, just so, just so I'm following. Yeah. So you became part of kind of like a house group sort uh, of... I'd, I was by this point, I'd been part of a house group for some time and because I moved eventually from where I was. Angela and I decided it was time for us to not be living together all the time. Yeah. And I moved in with a lady called Madhu. A friend of a friend put me in touch what, with what was then North London Community Church Um, but also, but it was also partly she put me in touch with a couple who went there because I I needed help with my drama lessons. From the start, it felt like a family who supported one another. Mm. This was the first time in London that I'd come across that kind of family. Mm. Uh, And I've written down here, it was real Christian life and love. Mm. People telling telling it as it is. And trusting God to change stuff, which you've heard a little bit about as I've explained it. Um, Family warts and all. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But love makes it possible to work through the differences of opinion. And there were quite a few. Um, And mistakes. (laughs) And to forgive and move forward. Wow. So several different house groups, but in all of them, there was this caring for one another and learning to forgive one another learning that we're all very different because Angela and I were very different and it was really important that when she did become a Christian that she she had other examples not just me for her Christian life because she was such a different personality from from me that she needed to see how it worked for other personalities. Yeah. So the house group was a brilliant place for her to see lots of different expressions of Christianity, mm. but the same love going throughout. Yeah. And at, at what point did you meet Andy? Right. Well, that that was another sort of interesting one. We were doing right. We were doing a kind of a mission, going house to house, to tell people about Jesus, and. 
um, we met a, a young lady and we'd been sharing the gospel with her and we started praying together for her. In fact, the only reason I was with Andy going house, um, house to house was because both of us had had different partners. But that afternoon, both of our partners had something else to do. And right. the person who was deciding who went with who put the two of us together. And then Andy never realised he was set up. Um, I was living with Madhu and her daughter, Anila. And Anila had been to see The Witness, which was a film with Harrison Ford. OK. And she said to Andy, and I was stood behind him, luckily, Andy, I think you'd really enjoy The Witness as a film. And I think Leonie would as well. <laughs> And believe it or not, my thick husband never realised that he'd been set up. <laughs> By this point, I was bright red with embarrassment, <laughs> but he didn't turn round. And and it still sort of facing Anila, he said, oh, Lenny, would you like to go to the witness then? <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> now, he didn't know, Madhu did and Annie did, that I actually fancied him. <laughs> and he thought that I was too spiritual to possibly want to go out with him. He'd become a Christian just two years before. But we start, We went to this film, The Witness. There was a scary bit. I grabbed hold of his hand because it was scary and we didn't let go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the short version. I'll tell you the long <laughs> yeah. version another day. So how has God continued to show himself to be real to you and what has made you stay in good maze in this part of the community Exeter and all these other places that are way more beautiful and, and wonderful. How have you seen God as you've as you've now started marriage and obviously become parents and Well, there's been that constant support throughout our marriage. Mm -hmm. Um and I've seen it obviously more recently as my husband got very, very ill last summer. Mm -hmm. He had a stage four glioma cancer in the brain. And we've seen love in action. So we've seen it throughout because, I mean, when my daughter was eight days old, she was rushed into hospital and they weren't sure she was going to live. The church at the time were on a church holiday. But some people in the church had not gone on the holiday. We hadn't because I was, I was about to give birth. Yeah. But there was another couple and... Daily, we were communicating with them and they were compu communicating with the church on holiday. And at the time, every day, the church were praying for Anna. Mm. And we saw answer after answer. And Anna going from, I mean, from the very first night when they prayed and the church started praying for me, because I was very frightened. And that first night... A nurse walked in from Sierra Leone, who was a Christian, and she looked at me and she said, God has told me your little one will live. Wow. Now, you don't get that kind of thing happening in a hospital normally. No, it's not, it's, not, it's not part of the training. <laughs> not really part of the training. And then as the church went on praying, we discovered that by sheer fluke, they'd got the right antibiotic. If they'd got the wrong one, she'd have died. They had to guess before they actually got all the results. It turned out to be a severe kidney infection that she'd got. They're not sure how, they, how she got it, but they got the right antibiotic and within five days we were home. Later on, as I said, um, <laughs> we saw David. This is your son. This is my son. When we went to the Isle of Wight to see a couple on the Isle of Wight and I thought David was with Andy, my husband. Andy thought David was with me. At this point, David's not of an age where he's... He's four the... years old. Okay. He had somehow escaped into the garden to explore the duck pond he'd been told not to go near and had fallen in it. Oh, my goodness. But the first thing we knew, he was standing on... And that he knew, he was standing on the lawn covered in duckweed. He doesn't know how he got out. We don't know how he got out. We can only believe, given that the couple that were counselling us had been fasting and praying for us for three days, 
that God sent an angel and basically hiked him out because there is no logical explanation to how my son didn't die. That's amazing. So that was sort of early in our marriage, which was an interesting start to a marriage. (laughs) Yeah. Of course, sadly, Andy passed away. He did. In January. He passed away in January. And just speaking from a human perspective, that is that is of course not the outcome we wanted. But I know you, you said that there was a particular approach. Not approach, there was something that Andy was holding on to and continuing to say to people about how he viewed things. Can can you give me a yes. an insight into that? I can. Um and this was where we saw really something very, very special. Two things happened. He kept saying, I don't know why God loves me so, loves us so much. And he was just overwhelmed by God's love. And he kept thanking God for everything. And even down to the point where he was getting a bit confused at the end. And he'd had the carers, the same ones coming day after day. But he said, in front of them, God, I'm not sure who these people are, but thank you for them anyway and for all they've done. And he was just so thankful Mm. right up to the end. Amazing. Leonie, I've really, really appreciated your time. And I would personally, I I feel like I've just taken off the first layer. Um, But I do, I I, want to bring it to a close, but I want to... um, just share a little story, particularly when I think of Andy and yourself. Um, you might not remember this, and I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was at some point in the last 10 years. Um, I can't remember the circumstances, but my car wouldn't start, and Andy uh, helped, helped me get my car going. And I think my dad actually suggested, why don't you drop Andy around a couple of bottles of ale? Yeah. Um, just just as a thank you. And I thought that's a good idea. So I think it was a Friday morning. It was definitely a weekday morning. I just popped around, yeah. obviously, was living at my parents just around the corner. Um, and you, you guys invited me in. And you had, um, in the room that we're in now, you had food all over the table. There was there was quite a spread. Um, so I was just, you know, wanted, wanted to say thank you. And you, you guys explained that actually, I don't know how often, but you were kind of doing an open morning for your neighbours of some yes. sort. And um, I just remember being so struck by that. What was it that would make you open up your house to, okay, your neighbours, but essentially living in an area like we do, relative strangers wanting to invite them into your home. Um, what is it that would that would make you do such a thing? Both Andy and I had a vision to reach out to the neighbourhood. And we couldn't really enact it until we both retired. But I'd always had a, a real sense that we needed to, to touch our neighbours' lives. Mm-hmm. But then we'd sort of lost contact with us both working. And we thought, now we're retired, we can actually make a, a difference to the road. And that's really what's happened. I mean, I when Andy got really ill, I was helped by the church. But my neighbours up and down the road, as soon as they heard what had happened, he was so loved by yeah. so many people yeah. that we've been given food, um, various curries from up and down the road for the last couple of months. Wow on a regular basis and different other little things or fruit and and different things and people have come and then a phone call from another Muslim lady whose husband had also had a brain tumour but we'd prayed for him and he was actually he had an operation and he has recovered I am about to start tea and coffee for the neighbourhood in the next couple of months again because I've already had the the people just down the road, we have a, a home for people with learning difficulties. Yeah. And at Andy's funeral, one of them came up to me and said, when are you starting doing tea and coffee again? <laughs> so I've had to say, yes, it will not be too long. Well, well, Leonie, I really want to thank you for your time. Um, I think just 
I'm struck by how real God has shown himself to be to you. Um, going back to your teenage years, talking recently in, in really difficult time. I mean, let's, 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 let's not pretend that it's easy, but just no. the way in which you speak about who you have seen God to be is inspiring. But not only is it, I don't want to just say inspiring, like, oh, that's a lovely story. It actually, I feel honoured to be part of the same church community as you. And I, I obviously have um, loads of fond memories, uh, particularly of, of, of Andy. And yeah. um, But I'm just so grateful that, that even just hearing you speak about the teas and coffees and, yeah, I can just see God's got so much more for you. So yeah. thank you. We have an amazing God and I am looking forward to seeing what he is going to do in the future.